Hey everybody, and welcome once again to Nose in the Book, a Bible reading commentary with me, your host, Pastor Justin Van Reed. Got some great chapters from God's Word today, some really full chapters, and so let's get right to it. We're going to take a look at Exodus chapter 6, Job 23, Luke 9, and 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And once again, if there's something from these chapters that I don't cover, please feel free to post it in the comment section below, and I'll do my best to answer any questions. All right, we begin here again in Exodus chapter 6, and we're back with Moses, who goes to the Lord with the fact that the, um, that when he went to Pharaoh, Pharaoh said no, and then made the labor harder on the people. And so he says, basically, you know, he cried out to God there, and now God answers him and says, I will deliver my people. Right? He, he introduces himself again as Yahweh. Uh, he says, uh, I am Yahweh, the Lord, I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai, God Almighty, but I did not reveal my name to them. I reaffirmed my covenant with them. Under its terms, I promised to give them the land of Canaan, where they were living as foreigners. You can be sure that I have heard the groans of my people, who are now slaves to the Egyptians. I am well aware of my covenant with them. Therefore, say to the people, I am the Lord. I will free you from your oppression. So God is very clear to Moses. Go back and tell the people, I am the Lord. I am going to free you. I am your God, your family, your covenant, your ancestors, your people's God, and I am the God of all the earth. I am the God who really is, and I'm going to do this. So Moses goes back to the people and says what God says. Here's what the Lord says. He's going to deliver you, and the people don't listen. They're having none of it because so far all Moses has brought is harder labor upon them. And so then Moses goes back to the Lord and in essence complains to God and says, my own people won't listen to me anymore. How can I expect Pharaoh to listen? I'm such a clumsy speaker. So he says, this is not working out, Lord. And then we have this little interlude of uh, genealogy of uh, Moses' family. And, uh, and then at the end of the chapter, it reiterates Moses' complaint before the Lord. But he hasn't done any of the miracles yet. And so he's going to go before Pharaoh next chapter and begin to, uh, and God's going to begin to show his power to both the Egyptians and the Israelites. God has a dual purpose here. He's going to make himself known and be great among the Egyptians so that they will you know, face judgment and know that he is God, but then also he's going confirming who he is to his people Israel so that they will believe and follow him. All right, we turn then to the book of Job, Job chapter 23. And here Job has this uh, poetic cry that I wish I could present my case to God. Where is he? I can't find him. If I could find him, I would lay out my case to him. But uh, but I know that ultimately he is in control and he does what he wants. And so I'm scared. He says, I know that I've not done wrong. I'm righteous. And so I wish I could lay out my case and defend myself to the Lord. But where do I find him? And so he says, but even though I'm righteous, God's going to do what God's going to do. There's no stopping him. And so Job at the end here says, no wonder I am so terrified in his presence. When I think of it, terror grips me. God has made me sick at heart. The Almighty has terrified me. And so uh, Job just doesn't know why the things that are happening to him are happening to him. All right, then we come to Luke chapter 9. And uh, this is another really big, really full chapter. These chapters in Luke just really pack it in here. I mean, we've got a number of things going on, uh, well known from the gospel accounts. You have Jesus sending out the 12. In Matthew, that's like a whole chapter here. That's just a part of this chapter. Then you have Herod. And, uh, and you know, I love this because Herod's like, you know, who is this? He says, some are saying is John the Baptist had been raised from the dead. And and John and Herod's like, I cut off John's head. So who is this man about whom I hear such stories? And he kept trying to see him. So Herod's got this interest in Jesus, wants to find Jesus and wants to talk with Jesus. But meanwhile, Jesus, after the disciples return, he goes away here with the 5,000, with the crowd. And uh, it's the feeding of the 5,000. And we've seen this before in uh, the other Gospels, Matthew and Mark. But here, what I want to point out is, again, going back to Luke chapter 4 and what Jesus said about Elijah and Elisha the prophets. Because what, when you ask the question, well, why these miracles? Why does Jesus do this kind of thing? Well, this is exactly what the prophets do. Those who are from the Lord, in the Old Testament, we read 
Not only do, does, uh, do, do they raise the dead, which we've seen Jesus do, including that very specific raising of the widow's only son, but also Elijah and Elisha both have a role in uh, basically reproducing food. And of course, God's the one who's doing it, but uh, there's a con- confirming nature of both Elijah and Elisha being from the Lord. Elijah does it, remember, when he goes to, uh, to the widow and, uh, and you know, she thinks she just has a little bit left of oil, and she's just going to, you know, make the last meal and then die, and it never runs out, right? During the famine, it just keeps, it just keeps on being there every time she goes back. And Elisha, he does it with this, with this stew. And so here's Jesus then feeding the 5,000. And again, this would be another indication if people could go back and read their Bibles and say, wait a second, I, this sounds familiar. I remember Elijah, remember Elisha, remember what they did. And this confirms again, the Lord is uh, God, uh, Jesus is from God, and truly we should listen to him. But of course, this goes on here. He, he has this the Peter's declaration about Jesus, right? Who do people say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Messiah sent from God. This goes right into Jesus predicting his death and calling for picking up your cross, following him to death, surrendering your life. And then this is followed by the transfiguration. So you have Jesus again. It's a really packed chapter. Jesus being changed in the presence of Peter and John and um, and and the uh, and, and Moses and Elijah showing up, and then you have uh, it goes on uh, the, the greatest in the kingdom. A great discussion here um, uh, about G- the cost of following Jesus, right? When he, he answers these various uh, people who come to him and say, "Hey, I want to follow you, but let me first, you know, return home and bury my father. Or I'll follow you wherever you go." And all of this, and Jesus says, anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. And so God, Jesus calling people to surrender their lives, to put him number one, to follow him, to recognize who he is and trust him, and give your life to him. All right, and then we come to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I love this chapter. Really, it is. Uh, it speaks to what I've often said and what I've been even saying today here. Um, Paul rehearses some of the wilderness journey of the Israelites in the Old Testament. But what he does here, he says twice, he says, verse 6, these things happened as a warning to us so that we would not crave evil things as they did or worship idols as some of they them did. And then he quotes the scriptures. And then again in verse 11, these things happened to them, the Israelites in the wilderness generation. But he says they are uh, written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. So it happened to them, but they're written down. It wasn't just God working in that generation, but God then preserving his word, giving his word in recounting what God has done so that each generation would read and recognize who he is and would learn from his people and their mistakes in the past. And so this is the importance, speaks right to the importance of the word of God, of reading and studying the Old Testament scriptures and, uh, and learning there what God is like, who he is, what he's done, uh, what his people have done, what, it, what the struggles that they faced in following him, and picking up their cross, you might say, and following him, and you know the temptations of sin that they faced, and so that we would read these things and learn from them. So, so important. Again, we talk about having our nose in the book, and that's not just the New Testament. That goes for the Old Testament as well. God's word, his holy word given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, profitable for everything that we need so we would be equipped to follow him, to serve him, to know him. And so, so important here that we learn from Israel, from their experience following God in the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament. Of course, Paul would not have called it that. Now, this is still all in the context of meat sacrificed to idols. So after he says all of this, this way he talks about the temptation that comes on. So he says, flee from the worship of idols, because he's talking about that food that was sacrificed to idols. And so he's talking about, look, we, we can't, you know, we, we, he says, we, 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 you know, we got to think about this carefully. It's not just a matter of there's the idols are nothing. And so I can eat the food sacrificed to idols because he says, am I saying food offered to idols has some significance or that idols are real gods? He says, no, not at all. But I'm saying that these sacrifices are offered to demons, not to God. And I don't want you to participate with demons. So be really careful here about your freedom and the use of your freedom. And then he summarizes this, and it's beautiful here what he says. He says, uh, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And that's the standard, right? That's 
You know, everything that we do, let's just pause and ask that question. If we're thinking, should I do this? Is this right? Is this good? Stop, time out, and ask the question, can I do this for the glory of God? And if we say, yes, this is something that can be done for the glory of God, follow that up with a second question, am I doing it for the glory of God? What is my motivation? All right, that's all we have time for today. Again, we had Exodus chapter 6, Job chapter 23, Luke chapter 9, and 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Hope you enjoyed our time together in God's Word today. Until next time, keep your eyes on the Lord and your nose in the book. Thanks. We'll see you again soon.